Those of us who live outside the borders of the United States of America have spent much of the past four plus years trying to understand what explained the directions it was taking. According to New York Times columnist Ross Douthat, to make sense of modern day America, it's necessary to look back and with a wider lens. That's the mission of his new book. It's called The Decadent Society, America Before and After the Pandemic. And Ross Douthat joins us now from New Haven, Connecticut. And it's good to have you on our airwaves tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's terrific to be with you. Let us start with just a basic definition, because not everyone's going to agree on what you mean by decadence. What do you mean? So sadly, I don't just mean chocolate covered strawberries and, you know, weekend trips to Las Vegas. I'm trying to use decadence to describe basically a period of stagnation, drift and repetition for a society that's at a high level of wealth and power and development. Um, so in order to be a decadent society, you have to have first been a successful society. And to be decadent, it's not enough to, uh, you know, have, you know, too many people going to speakeasies in the 1920s or something like that. You actually have to have sort of stalled out, um, become stuck, and be unable to sort of figure out what your lines of advance are going forward. And the argument of the book is that that is basically what's happened, not just to the United States, but to the United States, especially um, since the 1970s, over the last 50 years. So by your definition, then, steady, sluggish economic growth rates of, say, one and a half to two and a half percent over the last many decades, that's an indication of decadence? Yes. So uh, basically, starting, starting in the late 1960s or early 1970s, the whole developed world, led by the U.S., entered this period of deceleration. So economic growth didn't disappear, but we went from a world where it was normal to have four or five or six six percent economic growth consistently to a world where, you know, in a good economic period, you would be limping along at two or three percent growth. Um, and then, of course, since this would be punctuated by um, financial crises and recessions that took a while to climb out from, you could have long periods of time, as in the U.S., from basically 2000 to 2015, where people weren't making, you know, people were were sort of working harder and harder to just catch up to where they'd been five or 10 or 15 years before. Um, so yes, that's basically, stagnation in this case doesn't mean no growth at all, but it means slower and slower growth compared to, you know, the 19th and early 20th century. Well, here's another metric, birth rates. Uh, even in countries like uh, Ireland and Italy, we're seeing very stagnant growth rates. Again, in your view, is that a sign that these societies have become too decadent? Yeah, I think it's a very, um, a very strange and troubling indicator when the wealthiest societies in the world are not reproducing themselves. Um, when you and and this has become true of again just about every wealthy society in the world since the '60s, since the end of the baby boom, has started having fewer kids than it needs to replace its own population. Um, and this started in Europe. Um, it's become actually quite extreme on the Pacific Rim, where South Korea, for instance, if you need two births uh, per woman to maintain um, replacement level population, it's called, South Korea has less than one birth. So its population is just going to start dropping. Same with Germany. And the U.S. was an outlier for a long time, up until the 19, late 1990s. Um, the U.S. was still at replacement level fertility or slightly above, which I think American conservatives especially like to cite as an example of American exceptionalism. Um, but since the Great Recession, U.S. birth rates have fallen, too. We look a lot more like Western Europe right now. And COVID has almost certainly um, knocked birth rates even lower. There's going to be a pandemic-era baby bust um, in just about every country seriously affected by the virus. Ross, I must say the ne next metric I'm going to raise I found somewhat amusing, which is your notion that another sign of decadence is the fact that all the big movies at the box office, when we were allowed to go to movies, are superhero comic book type movies. How is that a sign, in your view, of decadence? So this is one where it's harder to put a you know a sort of statistical measurement on it. But um, what you see in Western culture, and I think you see this in intellectual culture too, but uh, it's sort of heightened in pop culture is 
that we're all sort of living inside the stories that were told when the baby boom generation was young. Um, so stories that, that were sort of invented and crafted between the 1940s and 1980 or so um, are just increasingly the only stories people, people seem able to tell. And this is sort of interacted with trends in blockbuster movie making, the need to sort of sell movies overseas and have a certain kind of lowest common denominator um, storyline to mean that all we get are Marvel movies, DC movies, Star Wars movies, um, recuts and new edits of superhero movies, four hour cuts of superhero movies, like the one we've just been delivered by Zack Snyder with, with the new Justice League. Now, hang um, on, Ross, I, Ross, did you yeah. see that movie? I know it's not, I'm I it's it you you could sort of argue that that Snyder himself is is trying to fight decadence in the absurd gonzo over the top to make a four hour superhero movie is in a sense to strike a blow against decadence I will concede that okay good because I, I actually watched it this past weekend just for fun because I knew I was going to be talking to you it's terrific and it's not your typical sort of you know very predictable very uninteresting superhero movie. So I, I, I think you, I know you're not the film critic for the Times, but I think you should see it. And then in the sequel to the book, the paperback, when it comes out, you can point out that Zack Snyder's four hour epic on uh, Justice, the Justice well, League. It's a tipping point, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it is, you know, you what you're looking for, especially now, as God willing, we enter the post COVID era are sort of signs of cultural innovation, signs of cultural life. And maybe that does start with um, still in the sort of orbit of superhero movies, but with people delivering um, auteurist four-hour blockbusters instead of just sort of two hours of quips and jokes and people in, in um, superhero costumes. Mm -hmm. Well, all of this raises the issue, of course, of whether or not what you are describing is in fact problematic. There are many people who would take these facts and say, this is evidence of, of a wonderful thing. Why do you not see that? So, right, so this is this is not a crazy argument at all, right? I can imagine many viewers would listen to the news about declining birth rates and say, well, that's great. We won't overstretch our ecosystems and, you know, contribute to environmental damage anymore. Um, and you could argue that slowing growth rates, economic growth rates are, are good in that sense, too, that we're sort of moving towards sustainability in some sense. Um, and if the price of that is that we're just telling the same stories over and over again, well, you know, people people really enjoy superhero movies, right? So this is, and, and I think there's some truth to this in that there are lots of ways to escape decadence that you'd rather not do, right? Like, you know, a global pandemic is not particularly decadent, um, but we'd rather not live through it again in the next five or 10 or 15 years. A world war is not decadent, but it's a bad idea to start a world war to get out of decadence. So there are ways clearly in which a kind of sustainable decadence is better than some alternatives. The problem with it is that one, it sort of gradually cuts off a lot of the things that are great and wonderful about human societies and human civilizations, which are sort of creativity and ambition and sort of, you know, dreams of exploration. I think it's a bad thing that the space age sort of petered out um, after the Challenger disaster. I think it's a good thing that, you know, as crazy as he may be, Elon Musk aspires to take human beings to Mars. So I think there's, there's, there's that problem, right, which is sort of a kind of creativity and greatness deficit that you get into. But then also in a really rich society that has a lot of technological distractions, there's a kind of what you might call the brave new world problem after Aldous Huxley's dystopian novel, which lots of people still read, I imagine, in high school. And in that story, you have a society that's incredibly rich and, you know, with genetic engineering to sort of make every level of society fit together. And no one, no one falls in love or gets married anymore. You have virtual reality pornography to substitute for that. And it's a society that, you know, is sort of everyone's on various mood altering drugs to keep them happy all the time. And it's a dystopia, but it's a wealthy, you know, sort of stable, in certain ways, successful dystopia. It's just a really dark vision or you know you could do the same thing with wally -E, the pixar movie right where after the earth is trash people go into space and end up sitting around slurping big gulps and watching tv for the next thousand years of human history that's under decadence you can basically slide towards dystopia so slowly 
that you wake up one day and you realize, you know, wait a minute, we're a society that sort of hypermedicated, substituting pornography for sex and marriage, not having kids anymore. Maybe this isn't the place we want to be. No, I hear you, and, and you make the case well in the book, but, um, but I wonder what you would say to Steven Pinker, whom you also talk about in the book, who has essentially, I don't know if you can say he's empirically provable, you know, using empirically provable facts, he has categorically proven the fact that we're living in the best times ever, but before the pandemic hit, you could certainly argue that it would be better to be the majority of humanity today than 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, etc., right? I mean, I, I think Pinker has a strong argument just based on material conditions. Um, the United States certainly is wealthier today um, than at any point in its history. And but there and the same, you know, and there are parts of the world, um, China, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia that have come into greater wealth and lifted millions of people out of poverty in the last 20 or 30 years in ways that are not under my definition, decadent at all, right? The argument in the book isn't that sub-Saharan Africa is decadent. It's that it's this is a particular problem of the developed world. But then inside the developed world, I mean, there are sort of two questions for the Pinker thesis. The first question is, are we, are we still accelerating or is the whole world sort of converging on this kind of more stagnant, um, less dynamic future, right? So it may be that Pinker is accurate, accurately describing the second half of the 20th century, but not the 21st century. The other, I think, more important point for, for Pinker's argument is this may be the best of all possible times in terms of material conditions, but people don't seem particularly happy with it, right? You have, you know, rising rates of suicide in the U.S., drug addiction, opioid abuse. Um, you have sort of relational failures. People are less likely to get married. They're less likely to have kids. They're less likely to do the kind of things that we associate with human flourishing. And then there's a lot of political discontent, right? You, you know, you opened our conversation by mentioning some of the strange things that have happened in the U.S. over the last 10 years. Um, and you could extend that story to Europe, maybe not fully to Canada yet, but, you know, give it another 10 or 20 years and we'll see. And that discontent, whether it's embodied by Donald Trump supporters or Bernie Sanders supporters on the left, you know, it takes a lot of different forms, but it seems like people feel like the future was not all that it was cracked up to be. And just sort of quoting GDP statistics at them might not be sufficient to address that kind of, um, you know, sort of late modern anomie and disappointment that's a really important part of both culture and politics in the Western world right now. No, absolutely fair point. And I, and I did find interesting the fact that uh, when I was reading your book, uh, I found it interesting that if I were going to make a Venn diagram of your book and Chris Hedge's book, and I don't think of you two as being ideological soulmates, but there is a lot of overlap. And, and you two come at society in very different ways. What I know what he would say, because we've had him here, and what, what he would say needs to be done to combat what he sees as a very problematic, not sure he'd use the word decadent, but problematic society. Uh, where's your cure? What are you looking to? I mean, I don't think there is a single cure. I think that if you, if you take this kind of wide-angled lens view of human history and you say, okay, if our period is decadent, what do you, what's better than decadence? Well, a renaissance, right? So what gives you a renaissance? Well, you know, you can pick different times, but if you go to the original, you know, the original Western Renaissance, right, the 16th century, what you see is tons of things happening all at once. You have, um, you know, sort of religious transformation in the Protestant Reformation. You have technological change, the beginning of the age of modern science. You have incredible artistic creativity um, in, you know, the Italian Renaissance itself, um, political change, exploration overseas. So in a similar way, I think what you're looking for, maybe, maybe there's some sort of specific catalyst, right, where some set of technological breakthroughs leads to economic and political reforms leads to new artistic forms and creativity. Um, but I think if it actually happens, we won't be able to say, oh, this was the one thing that made it happen. Zack Snyder's Justice League, you know, <laughs> it was the spark, the spark that lit the blaze. I think you'll see a lot of different things. Like, like it may be, for instance, that our response to the coronavirus, our scientific response, is the beginning of, you know, a wave of medical breakthroughs that will change 
um, medicine and science over the next 10 or 15 years. If that happens, what you're looking for then is how does that spill over? How does that affect politics? How does that affect religion? How does it affect the things that are so, sort of core sources of human ambition and the core sources of human meaning that seem to have run a bit dry? Um, but yeah, so I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I'm a religious person, so I tend to assume that any kind of renaissance will have a strong religious component. But I think above all, it will have multiple components happening in ways where it's hard to say one thing caused it all. Well, let me nudge you a little more on, in this direction because the book, when it originally came out in hardcover, was February 2020. So we know what happened the next month, right? We've got a massive pandemic. Uh, we've got uh, the racial reckoning brought on by George Floyd. Uh, we have the defeat ultimately later in the year of Donald Trump. A, a, I think it's fair to say a fairly not religious person uh, replaced in the White House fair. by a very religious person, a man who goes to church, a man who is empathetic and God-fearing. I don't think you could say any of those things about his predecessors. Predecessor, excuse me. Does that make you change the outlook of the book originally as written in Feb 2020? Not exactly, no. I mean, I think, I think there are things that have happened in the last year, um, including the kind of scientific breakthroughs that I just mentioned, that are undecadent. And I think there are scenarios where an, a Biden administration, if it gets a kind of growth boost from the economy coming out of the coronavirus, um, that creates more space for political reforms. You know, you, you can tell a story where Biden era liberalism actually accomplishes a political realignment. And maybe again, that is, that is sort of how how the world starts to change, you know, how transformation starts to happen. Biden himself, though, is, you know, he is a very old man who is the embodiment of a, a U.S. political establishment that presided over a series of debacles and failures in the first couple decades of the 20th century, um, including, you know, including the Iraq war, the financial crisis, but also, I think, a mishandling of our relationship with China, a failure to sort of realize the social problems that were flowing from globalization, um, deindustrialization, and so on. So he, he embodies that establishment, and his piety, while totally sincere, belongs to, I think, a form of liberal Christianity that is relatively weak in American life, that was most potent in the 1960s and 70s. And Biden, along with Pope Francis in certain ways, has given it this kind of comeback moment but it's not clear, like, if you look at Americans under 40, that this is actually sort of the religious future. So I think you can just as easily tell a story where the pandemic sort of, you know, it hit, it hit a kind of recess button on a lot of trends in American politics. American voters decided we don't want to go with the socialist Bernie Sanders. We want to get rid of Trump. We want to go back to the establishment. But the establishment still, you know, lacks credibility, presided over a series of failures, and not totally clear that Joe Biden is the man to sort of transform politics as opposed to just being sort of the president of sustainable decadence, you might hmm. say. Uh, Ross, it's a, in our last minute here, it's a measure of how important the New York Times is to the world and uh, to your country in particular, that when stuff happens there uh, that's controversial, a lot of people pay attention. So I do want to ask you, uh, just in our last minute, about you know, about some of the personnel changes that have happened in the New York Times of late, and they have happened because of, well, because of this moment in history. Uh, some people will call it political correctness. Other people will say it's a racial reckoning. Whatever it is, um, some very, very curious things have happened at the paper in the last couple of years. And I wonder what you make of those tensions that are roiling your newsroom right now. I mean, I think that, you know, some of the obvious tensions at my newspaper are not at all unique to the times. And they reflect, I think, a sort of conflict that's kind of internal to liberal institutions right now um, about um, that sort of represents, you know, a kind of a vision, a sort of competing visions of liberalism, um, competing visions of you know, sort of what kind of arguments should be held open, what kind of arguments should be declared closed. And, you know, you have, I think it's every, everyone can see it within, whether it's in newspapers or Ivy League universities, um, 
or you know sort of down down the line of institutions hollywood and so on that there is a a sort of emergent progressivism um that has you know that that sort of has has a transformative vision that sort of has somewhat different ideas about um the role that media academia and so on should play in society and so i mean it's interesting for me since i'm a conservative columnist at the newspaper in some ways i'm sort of observing some of these conflicts as as an as an outsider to both sides mm -hmm. in a way um which hopefully means that i have somewhat interesting things to say about it but it's it's one of the big it's it's clearly one of the big sort of internal questions for liberalism in the western world over the next 10 or 15 years um is you know what what does liberalism mean um and how how different can it be um over the next generation do i infer from that comment that you're not completely comfortable with the way donald g mcneil jr was ousted from the times i mean i don't want to comment on i i wrote a column when uh, james bennett who was of course my my mm -hmm boss um as as steward of the editorial page um when when he lost his job during the the george floyd protests um that was critical of the firing so you know i'll leave that if if viewers are interested they can find that column and that can stand as my my take on some of this fair enough ross doubt that's latest is the decadent society america before and after the pandemic and we're grateful you spared so much time for us on tvo tonight thanks ross thanks so much for having me The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.